we're interviewing today Richard Cogdale. Richard is the director of the Institute for Cell, Molecular and Synthetic Biology at the University of Glasgow. It's great to talk to you today. R Richard is an expert in photosynthesis. And you spent a lot of your life studying bacterial photosynthesis. <laughs> and, and it's a complicated process by a variety of approaches, you elucidated details. But from, from my understanding, a thing that just broke the field loose was the crystal structure of the light harvesting complex. Uh, why was that such a big deal? Well, if you want to really understand how a pigment protein complex works, if you've just got a black box and you don't know where all the things inside the box are, you can only get a very low level understanding. But once you have a, a three dimensional picture of how it works, then you can understand all the spectroscopy, then you can understand all the functional information. And for us, also, because this was a beautiful symmetric complex, and the eye appreciates symmetry as being beautiful, it was a very strong attractant to chemists and physicists and mathematicians around the world. So instantly, all the people we needed to collaborate with to solve the problem, to really understand this process, all were very interested and excited to join us. So it was twofold. One is when you've got the structure, you can really understand function. But secondly, it was a powerful attractant to the right sort of people we wanted to work with. So now you brought in this interdisciplinary group and you looked at such detail at the complex that now you're thinking about synthetic biology, how you can modify the complex to do what you want. Well, I started life really just wanting to understand the basic process of photosynthesis. How is light energy absorbed, transduced into chemical energy? And it was a purely um, wanting to know how nature works. And we've got a lot of information from this now, and it's now become apparent if we can learn from nature to do what photosynthesis does, which is to actually use solar energy to make a fuel, maybe we can contribute to the world's renewable energy needs in a way which is going to be much more sustainable in the long term. So what started as a basic science project has now morphed into trying to see how we can use information. I never dreamt it would go that way when I started the project, and I guess that's true of, of what happens in science. Mm -hmm. so, so you describe your next series of events as a synthetic leaf. Right. But you started with photosynthetic biology, so why a leaf? Right. If you talk about photosynthesis, everybody understands what a leaf does. They may not understand the intricate structure and what goes on in the leaf, but the concept of a leaf of harvesting solar energy and making carbohydrate, everybody understands. So if you want to get people to really understand an artificial photosynthetic concept, the idea of an artificial leaf means that everyone, I can go home to my elderly aunt and she says, what do you do? And I can explain in terms of an artificial leaf and she can understand, even though she doesn't understand physics and chemistry and biology. So I think the concept is there. We, we don't think we're going to produce a leaf. Right. Of course not. But it's an idea that people can think about and understand the concept. Uh -huh. so, so synthetic biology means that you're going to put these pieces together in a new and different way. You're going to engineer them based upon your understanding. What are the real key challenges that you think are in making that artificial? Right. If you think in general terms what photosynthesis does, you can break it down from being a very complicated process into discrete, simple steps. First of all, you absorb solar energy. You concentrate it. And in complexes called reaction centers, they act like a solar battery and separate charge across a membrane. So you produce positive charges on one side, negative charges on the other. The positive charges are used to extract electrons from water to make the oxygen that we breathe. The negative charges are there to make fuel. So if you have that concept, you've simplified it down to four steps you have to duplicate. Now the first two steps are rather like a solar battery. So the question is, can you use renewable energy, let's say from a solar cell or from a windmill, to use that current to drive that chemistry? And that's what we're trying to do. The chemistry is the hard part. The first bit is actually relatively easy, and renewable sources that produce electricity now can do that much more efficiently than plants can. So if you can tap into that and then do the chemistry, that's what we're trying to do. 
uh, although predicting the future is very hard, I know. Do you, what would you guess that the timing will be before this is scaled up in a way that's going to impact the average person on the well, street? Of course, that's almost like asking someone how long is a piece of string. Right. And there's no real answer. What we can say is if the current level of investment carries on, then probably in about five or six years we can have a small pilot system in the lab to demonstrate it's feasible. But obviously to roll it out, to make it large and usable in the world, will take much longer. We have a window of opportunity before oil and gas significantly runs out of about 50 years. And really, how long it's going to take depends on how many people we can infuse to work in this area and how much funding can be put in. It requires a political will, to be honest, to put the type of effort in that your country put into putting a man on the moon, the Apollo missions. It's that sort of effort and commitment that's required. It'll be long after I stop being a scientist. I'm too old to see that all the way through now. But one of the things we're trying to do as well is really infuse young people. If you want an exciting project to work on that will change the world, here's one. We have to, if mankind wants to survive, devise ways of using solar energy to make a fuel. Otherwise, when all the fossil fuels run out, we won't be here. So, so that next generation of scientists, yeah. if you look at your work, you brought together biology, physics, chemistry, mathematics, this, this whole consortia of all of the sciences to address this problem. And in the, in the field of synthetic biology, there's going to be this need to have both inter- and multidisciplinary knowledge. Sure. What would you recommend for a student who's thinking about how to get that type of training to right. be the I next you. What they should do is to take a subject at university that they really enjoy, that's relevant to one of these areas, and really do well in that subject, but always in the back of their mind think, I'm gonna be brave. When I finish doing this, what I'm going to do is to I tackle an important problem that really excites me. And any important problem isn't solved just by one discipline. It's solved by bringing in all the disciplines required to solve the question. And you've got to be brave enough to take that jump into the unknown. I've recently got into things where we see quantum effects in light harvesting. I am not a quantum physicist, but you have to find a friend that is. You become friends and you start to do these experiments and they're amazingly exciting. And they blow your mind in terms of the things you ever imagined you'd have done when you started. I started as a biochemist. I mean, I'm not a physicist. But you've got to be brave and not be worried about, in the first instance, not understanding what you're getting into, but actually make that leap, form the network. And it's great. I mean, I can go around the world now, and I've got friends in almost every country and every major city that I can go and stay with. So when I came here, I went to UBC, and I spent a day with a person that I've known since he was a PhD student. So it's a marvelous thing. It's an exciting time to be a scientist. Thanks so much for talking to Pleasure. us, Richard.